there's one thing in life I can't stand, it's spiders. They should be illegal. But the second thing I loathe is being taken advantage of. Every day you're bombarded by attempts to manipulate you into parting with your hard earned money. You usually see it coming, you expect it, you're battle hardened against it, but this video is not about what you see. It's about what you don't. There are two types of manipulation that are virtually undetectable. Can we do something about the cello? It's dramatic. I'll teach you how to identify and defend against these silent bank account bandits. And at the end, punch in, if you, too close, if you promise to only use these powers for good, I'll explain how you can use them to your advantage. Should we do a little more cello? In 2011, I was unceremoniously introduced to the first technique. As first time home buyers, my wife and I lucked out with a real estate agent who was an expert in the local market, but endlessly patient. She also had a hidden superpower because you see every weekend we'd go out and look at homes. This happened for months. We looked at dozens of houses. Our real estate agent, whom we'll call Terry, because that's her name, knew our criteria and budget. My wife's one must have was a house with a fireplace. And the only thing I asked for was a house with a rooftop jacuzzi and room for a barbecue, kind of indoor outdoor vibe, wet bar. Terry informed me we'd need to triple our budget to accommodate my Peter Pan request. So I said, fireplace would be great. Weekend after weekend, walking through house after house, I thought I started to notice a pattern, kind of raised an eyebrow. Till one day it all came together like one of those fuzzy pictures that you gotta stare at and then like an elephant pops out at you. I could never do those. Everybody's like, just relax your eyes. I'm like, my eyes are relaxed, I'm relaxed. So without fail, if we were to see three houses in one day, the first house would be at the very low end of our price point, but there would always be something about the house that was just a deal break. The second house we'd see would be right in the sweet spot. Decent price, good neighborhood, fireplace. And the last house we'd see was always amazing, too amazing, well beyond our budget. Terry was manipulating us, and it's called the contrast principle. The human mind's a brilliant thing. It's created complex civilizations, painted masterful works of art, and figured out how to get that jelly inside the Pop-Tart. But our brains are dumb and easily tricked, but it's not our fault. It's how we evolved. So maybe it is our fault. Contrast principle works like this. If you pick up a heavy weight and then immediately after pick up a lightweight, Wait, baby! the lightweight will feel much lighter than it actually is because you intuitively compare it to that heavy weight. We magnify the difference between two things when we compare them in quick succession. Great show, by the way. You, I'm uh, sorry, what? So when Terry showed us an undesirable house first and then a house right in our zone second, that second house looked even more desirable than it would have if she had just shown it to us by itself. And then that second house would look like a great deal because we're comparing it to the next super ultra nice house with a rooftop jacuzzi. Anyone selling you anything who's worth their salt uses this contrast principle. And later I'll show you how you can use it to your own benefit if you promise to only use these powers for good. By the way, despite Terry's cunning techniques, she's a fantastic real estate agent. We found a house that had a fireplace on the rooftop. No, I'm just kidding, it was a regular fireplace. Think about the last time you bought a car at a dealership, right? After the salesman goes back and talks to the manager, comes back out and you settle on a price, the conversation quickly moves to little add-ons. Suddenly a $289 mysterious undercoating of the car seems super reasonable because you're comparing it to the price tag of 30, 40, 70, 80,000 dollars whatever you guys settled on. Now, the contrast principle is more pronounced in the higher ticket items, cars, houses, Bezos yachts, but it's more common on day-to-day -day purchases, so what it can do to your bank account is more like death by a thousand paper cuts. The second manipulation technique's even more sinister than the first, and when it gets stacked with the first, the two together work like a couple cold-blooded assassins. The crazy thing is, we do it to ourselves. In order to understand manipulation number two, we must first talk turkey. Mother turkeys are good turkeys. Loving, caring, protective, attentive of their young. Fairly normal in the animal kingdom, but what's weird is why mother turkeys behave this way. It's not the sight or scent of their chicks that inspire this behavior. Mother turkeys didn't read bringing up baby. They don't have time. They're single moms with newborns. The only thing that binds a mother turkey to her chick is the sound they make, that cheap cheap. As Caldini points out in his book, Influence, link below, that single noise is the only thing that ignites that caregiving instinct in the mother turkey. It flips a switch. The chicks being able to make that is the difference between being cared for 
or being ignored or even killed. Enter the polecat, the second biggest existential threat to turkeys after Thanksgiving. Some researchers got bored one day and stuffed the polecat, put it on a string and pulled it towards a mother turkey. Naturally, mom went ballistic, but the board researchers were also crafty because inside the stuffed polecat, they hit a tape recorder that played the sound that the chicks make. So when they hit play, a switch was flipped inside mother turkey and she would begin to care for that stuffed polecat as if it was one of her own. When the recorder was turned off, reality sunk back in and naturally, all hell broke loose against the stuffed animal. The scary part is we have those same switches to certain things in our own brains. So that makes us and our bank accounts exceptionally vulnerable to tricksters who know how to flip that switch and get us to hand over our hard earned money. To better understand how these tricksters work, we need not look farther than the insect that Katie did. Most Katie dids are happy with a steady diet of leaves. They could crush a salad bar. But the spotted Katie did was born with a manipulation technique to get its dinner to come to it. See, it was born with the ability to mimic the mating call of female cicadas. The male cicada hears a fake female mating call, thinks it's real, and cruises right into the arms of death's embrace. Katie did eats him up. Ever since we were little kids, we've been developing, shaping, refining a similar automatic response. Now think of a time where you really wanted to buy something, either recently or as a kid, and you had to save up money in order to make that purchase. Then the day came where you could pay for it. The anticipation of that event is intoxicating. My eight-year-old son's obsessed with skateboarding. It's a deep-seated passion that's burned within him ever since he first laid eyes on a skateboard about two weeks ago. So he scraped together enough money to afford a skateboard for himself. On the weekend, he's an Uber driver. And there we are at the skateboard aisle in the store. I can just sense the dopamine coursing through his veins. And he's quickly narrowed it down to two skateboards. It's the only two he can afford. And it takes him 5.2 seconds to look at both skateboards and declare, dad, I want that one. He points at skateboard number two. Fastest decision maker this side of the Mississippi, the switch had been flipped. Now the whole time I'm watching his eyes, which tell the story of his decision making process. It's more of a short story, it's all pictures. And his eyes went like this, skateboard one, price one, skateboard two, price two. The manipulation flipped the switch in his brain and got him. But what happened there? Sure, he's a kid. So here's an example with adults, adults who are too smart to be tricked. Researchers asked participants to drink an energy drink that supposedly enhanced cognitive performance. The participants were split into two groups. Group A was told that they'd pay full price, $2.89, while group B was told that the researchers got a discount on the price because they bought it in bulk so that they would only have to pay 89 cents. Both groups drank their drinks and then were asked to complete a variety of puzzles. Group A did better than group B across the board. And the only difference was that group A paid full retail price for the energy drink. Unbeknownst to both groups, they were manipulated, just like my eight-year-old son, by the same culprit. This type of manipulation is self-inflicted and the fancy term for it is judgment heuristic. But you probably also know it by its street term, stereotype. Our brilliant minds know that we should evaluate each scenario based on its own merit. But our brains are like, no time for that. We just need to make a decision and move on with life. And one of those stereotypes we've been honing ever since we were little is that expensive equals better. People love to say, you get what you pay for. And usually they're right. You pay three times as much for something and maybe you get a rooftop jacuzzi. But it can also be the source of a little leak in the bottom of our bank account through which money slowly drips out. The only discernible reason why my son wanted skateboard number two was because it cost more. And the same goes for the two groups that drank the energy drink. Group A knew they're getting at the full retail price, so it must be good. Group B knew that they were getting it at a discounted price, so the effects must also be discounted. So the question remains, what happens when the contrast principle and the judgment heuristic are both weaponized against you at the same time? Like, how do we even stand a fighting chance? Or better yet, how do you use those things to get what you want? First, in order to combat the contrast principle, we now know that it exists. And we've also identified some scenarios in which we'd find it. So first you need to spot the thing that's being compared to the thing you want and 
remove it altogether. When we were house hunting, I should have asked our realtor to see the houses on paper and just immediately removed option one. Now, if you can't remove it completely, you need to think of something to replace it with. And this is easier said than done, but we must try. Now for our instinct to stereotype things based on their price. Caldini points out to overcome our inclination to stereotype, two things must be present. We must first have a desire to do so. And we must also have the ability to fully inform ourselves about the decision at hand. In some cases, this is possible, but the pace at which modern life moves, we reserve this for specific instances. So how to use these techniques to benefit you? Also, I was just informed we have two more openings for new subscribers. So first come, first serve. The next time you're negotiating a price for yourself, and just like my high school Spanish teacher always said, the best defense is a good offense. He was a baseball coach, so that makes sense. This could mean a raise at work or just negotiating the price of something. It's super simple, but it might make you a little uncomfortable. Suppose you're negotiating a raise. What you want to do is throw out a big number at the high end of reasonable. It has to be within the bracket of reason. Otherwise, it'll just be viewed as outlandish and you've lost the opportunity. Another term for this is called anchoring. You basically anchor the negotiation at a high starting point. So as the countering happens and that number starts to come down, you end up settling on a number that still gives you a raise, but your boss is also content because that number's come down and he or she is contrasting it against that initial high number that you started with. If you want to deep dive into some of these negotiation techniques, I highly recommend the book by Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. Link below. Now using the stereotype technique in your favor basically means that you're just trying to flip that switch in the other person's brain. This happens in two steps. First, you must be viewed as honest and trustworthy and knowledgeable about the subject at hand, more knowledgeable than they are. This will likely result in them inherently just trusting what you say rather than going through the painful steps of one, mustering the desire to research the topic and actually having the ability to become as informed as you on this topic. But here's how this can all fall apart if you're not careful. Don't be slippery about it. Not just because that's ethically wrong to dupe people into doing things they wouldn't normally do, but because karma's gonna catch up with you, you'll get hit by a bus one day. And two, people can detect BS a mile away. Or for our friends across the pond, that's 1.6 kilometers. Even if you're an expert on the subject, but your delivery's poor, it's not gonna work. So become genuinely knowledgeable about the topic and hopefully you've built up an honest and trustworthy reputation and then deliver the information confidently. That's step one. Step two is expensive equals better. Suppose you're looking at a menu and you see a eight ounce filet mignon for $5.99. Just below it on the same menu, you see another eight ounce filet mignon for $59.99. Which one do you think is better? Spoiler, they're the exact same. So not only do they trust and believe you, but the item you're selling is at an elevated price, which to them just implies more value. Now you've sold an item, turned a profit, and they walk away a happy customer. But remember, you promised to only use these powers for good. 